Hi, I'm Victoria, and I'm a type designer. And I'm going to tell you a story about learning how to make a script typeface. And that's just because I happen to really enjoy hearing the stories of how people learn to do things that they do. And also, that's most of the stories that I have so far in my career. So I guess I'm just interesting like that. I came to fonts via script lettering. And so I like to think up ways of uh, exploring how those things overlap and how they um, are distinct from each other. So this is going to be about making a specific style of script lettering into a font. It's this one. You, you got that. The things that worked and the things that broke and whether you want to make a font that obscures the fact that it is, in font, that it is a font or just tackle hugs all of those problems into a chokehold, which is what I did. And so yeah, what I started, how I started, what I wanted to do, and how that changed, and everything that I screwed up and fixed, and now it's better. So quick exposition about me, because I can, because you all seem to be listening to me right now. Probably not unlike a decent chunk of the people that are into type and lettering, I think. Um, I got into this via this particular brand of scripty, swirly, almost in some cases saccharine lettering. Um, I came across it at a time when I uh, just was at the right point of hating my major and having no other plausible alternative, so that, that'll do it. Um, there I had been training to be an illustrator, which is to say to make images the ones that I was making were ones that accompany or that illuminate a message. Um, and then I figured out that you could draw things, letters, which actually are the message, and you know, that, that was it. And it seems to have stuck here. Here we are. So I was doing that kind of scripty, swirly thing on my own all the time. Um, I'm not showing you that now because I don't have to. Shoehorning it into assignments where it didn't make sense. And trying to make a font on a pirated version of FontLab and then on a legit version of RoboFont, and that went badly and then good. And then after college, with the extreme benevolence of uh, the people at Font Bureau, uh, under whose wings I like to say that I forcibly lodged myself, I, was, I had the great privilege to be taken on and trained to make fonts by Diana Weissman and Cyrus Highsmith. It means a lot that Cyrus is here today. So my job there was, it is, one, production, filling out other people's character sets for retail. Two, whenever they needed me to help out with any custom fonts for clients. And three, conceiving of and executing my own designs to be eventually released for retail, like this one that you're looking at right now. It's called Marsha. It's the only one I have so far, but we're working on it. So the whole time I'm doing this job, I'm doing lettering just for fun and getting better. Um, and it's the scripty stuff that I originally fell in love with making. And around then, I also started spending a lot of time with someone really special who also draws script fonts and lettering. And having him around was really upping my script game. So what I'm saying was the whole time that I had been making fonts, I had it looming over my head like, Victoria, you're going to have to come up with an idea for a script typeface at some point. And yeah, let's just, let's just go to there. That would start with this, which were some holiday cards that I made to send out to art directors and friends, mostly art directors. And I try to make as much of my work about food and Christmas festivities as possible, so the holidays are a really great time for me motivation-wise. Um, and for that middle lettering, it says gingerbread. Look at that. I referenced a style that I got from a book called The Script Letter by Tommy Thompson. It's what he refers to as freestyle lettering. And here are those samples. This book is important enough that we have two copies of it in our house for two people, because like, what if we both need it? Same. So here's what we're looking at that I drew. It's super yellow. An aside, if you were thinking at some point that maybe you would see some charming sketches on paper of this font, they don't exist. Um, for the most part, 
Like occasionally maybe I'll draw a pencil sketch to get something, um, the first 2% of the iceberg of an idea out, but usually I just go straight into a font editor. For me, like a lot of type designers, it's just more economical. As soon as I can get something in black and white, the sooner I can figure out everything that's bad and then fix those things and not be charmed by textures and I don't know, whatever. Anyway, this served the purpose that it had to on the cards. And then I had this lettering just chilling in a font file. And when you're me and you have some lettering in a font file, you try to come up with ways to get lettering, new lettering out of it really quick, just lazy. I do this all the time. So I wanted to make some pins. I don't remember. You just got to turn that lowercase g into a lowercase y and then make an H, and then we have some new lettering. And then I have this in a font file. And then I wanted to make a card for a friend for her birthday. All I needed here that I didn't have out of those two last things was some L's. So we have some L's, and now I have this in a font file. And then this just happened. Obviously, it's messed up in places, but I love this alphabet. This is super in charming to me. Um, I, I find it super fun, and fun, apparently, in lots of script typefaces can only mean one thing, and that's a forthcoming series of drastic compromises. <laughs> so like the charming wobble wobbliness and the slight variation that you see in the lettering that looked fine, that has to go. It just looks clumsy. And a single angle is chosen as the one angle. and. To make everything connect, we've also got to get rid of that little lowercase e that looks like the backwards three. Um, that was hard enough to negotiate in the lettering alone. It was, it was out. We also couldn't have the lowercase e, the other lowercase e structure from the references, like you know how cursive e's are just loops. That apparently the reason why you hardly ever see that in a font is because it just does not work without alternates to make it connect smoothly. So speaking of alternates, we have another problem now. And that's that this type looks great in some words and not as great in other words. We call this, I call this, we call this the uncanny valley where you have type that's made to look like lettering, but its cover gets busted when you see two of the same letter near each other, you know? that. You know that thing. So faced with this, we have two options. I can either, one, make a, try to make a font that has a bunch of alternate characters and to mimic real lettering. Lots of fonts do this really successfully. You know them, you love them. They seem like a lot of work. Um, it's obviously hard enough to get just one alphabet that looks good with itself, try two or three or six. Or option two was to tone it down. Around this time, I came across, well, this font called Peak by Nicole Doten just came out, which I love. It looks so good, and it has so few ligatures. I, I forget now. I think it has, like, maybe definitely less than 10, maybe around 5. Um, it still freaks me out how well the outgoing strokes of all the characters work at their own at the end of a word, and yet just casually glide into the next letter if there, if there is one. And so that pretty much cemented the goal for me for this particular project, that I wanted to give myself the assignment to try and tame this thing and make it have as few ligatures and alternates as possible, while still trying to be itself a little bit. And so I'm no longer making a thing that looks like freestyle lettering because I just can't. Um, I just wanted to make something that was informed by it. And if you've ever studied or drawn a typeface, you know that uh, that um, you want as many pieces of itself to relate to each other or maybe be completely identical to each other. Uh, but here, it's being a problem. Like all of these charming things where the top of the, but now the top of the F and the L's are identical and the descenders of the G and the Y are identical and the G and the A. Um, I love all of these things, but they call so much attention to themselves. And 
it, like they're very casual and quickly it became apparent that that casualness when it gets repeated near itself that's where the uncanny valley comes from um, all the things that made something look good as lettering and a font are like huh, charming disaster and another thing from that initial lettering that had to uh, lettering and font draft that had to go was how I had the connections in the lower case of the straight on the left side character set up. You can see I have the default ones on the top, that I and that N, M, um, that have that little little piece to be able to have smooth connections, and then uh, the alternates on the bottom. That would mean a lot of alternates for a lot of characters, and I did not like that idea, so that was gonna have to go. So here's what we're looking at, and it's gotta get more typographic, less loosey-goosey, bring it down. And now this is different. The open ascender and descender loops are gone. Now it's closed loops. The connections are now set up so that nothing needs an alternate to connect. Um, so this is technically doable, however, um, the real problem children for the no alternates rule are the R and the S. Especially because the N, the out, everything has an outgoing stroke, and these are the only ones that have an ingoing stroke too. And you get things like where the N in almost everything else has a connection coming out from the baseline, and the O has a connection coming out from near the middle. And so to get it to work with both of those, you have to have that little stumpy incoming stroke, which looks at good at the, in the middles of words, but bad at the beginnings of words. Uh, so we needed to come up with another solution. No alternates. I was also not convinced that this was acceptably modulated and typographic enough yet. It's still in that awkward territory. Especially the O next to itself, I was not convinced by it. Looks like it's trying to be lettering, but you're, it's not fooling you. Uh, P and the S or I don't know. So let's go back and stare at the references for a while. Like, boy, what does this tell us? Let's look. It says connections are hard. These letters have connections mostly, but not always. Okay, so what if we get this? What if we had instead of a connection situation, a partially connecting situation? Okay, so I'm not sure about this either, but let's look at what is working. Uh, the main feature was that the O is no longer being terrible, um, and it looks fine next to itself now because it's circles. And so we're definitely now passing into the safe territory of we're sure that this is a font and not lettering, which was a goal. And I liked the way that the connections in this seemed randomly scattered, even though they were coming out of the same six letters consistently. Um, and also, m probably most importantly, the R and the S were now carefully negotiated so that they worked well following any letter that had an outgoing connection and they worked well at the beginnings of words. But staring at the freestyle lettering sample again next to what I had, it seemed like maybe I overdid it. The ratio seemed off, like, uh, the disconnections probably shouldn't outnumber the connections so much. It didn't look like the references as much. And also, uh, it felt really awkward when you saw a word that had no connections at all. So it's time to redraw the connections back in. And this is looking pretty good to me. Uh, still some issues to be worked out with the spacing. Wanted it smoother, less stabby. Um, but this is where I could have stopped drawing, for the most part, where I had done what I had set out to do make a freestyle lettering script, an inspired script that didn't need any alternates or ligatures to work. Uh, there's one problem now, that O that actually works, uh, I didn't like it. Or more specifically, I didn't like the combination of an O right next to an R, which is, uh, if your <laughs> typeface doesn't look good in your own name, like what are you, what are you even doing? Um, I consider bringing a ligature in there. I wasn't convinced by it because the thing was when you had any remotely substantial chunk of text that had all of the normal O's and then maybe just one O-R, O-S ligature stuck in there, it was just so, it stuck out so much. It was so obvious that it was a ligature, it was so obvious that I cheated. And also looking at this now, 
maybe the plane O works too well. It is just circles, and it doesn't have any hint of stroke or direction like the rest of the alphabet has. Um, and in a last flailing effort to rectify both that and the OR thing, I went back to the Tommy Thompson and found this one B. There was nothing else really like it, but I, I found that one B, and I was like, okay, what if we did this, which I'm calling Tweety Bird O's. It's, it's got a little eyelashes. As I feared, this did not do well in focus groups, and by focus groups, I mean I showed it in a meeting, and people were like, really? So I was lamenting to my senior designer, Cyrus, one day about my OR problem and how I tried all these things to fix it, trying to find a compromise that would satisfy both my no alternates rule and my not making a sad looking font rule, you know, changing my name, et cetera. <laughs> Several iterations in, working alone on this thing, I was really deep now into trying to solve, the, meet this goal that I'd set for myself. And sometimes, I guess, you need someone on the outside to be like, dude, why? Like, just, um, just make a couple alternates. He didn't say dude, I don't think he says dude. Um, but that's how I compromised on my compromise, and I made some alternates. So I came up with yet another kind of O with a closed loop now. I'm not really sure why that took me so long to come up with. It goes with the other stuff. Um, and now we have a connecting script. It has contextual alternates for the R, S, X, and Z. So like four. <laughs> Deep breaths. The defaults, like on the second line, work well at the beginnings of words and after every letter, that, um, and after every letter. And the alternates, like on the first line, show up when they have to follow a B, O, W, or V, like in the name my parents gave me. So it's kind of hard to, you know, come up with something that shows the progress of all of these relations at the same time. But here's some words. Let's look at them um, and how they evolved. The outgoing strokes of the P and the S usually like to try to relate to each other. The P looked really bad next to itself for a really long time. It was um, it would tend to get clogged up really easily and yeah, trying to make it look not uncanny valley and yet not too mechanical. And the K also looked terrible next to itself forever. The open loops were also way too uncanny valley and the closed loops were too narrow and also bad. And then this kind of hybrid of the open loop and the closed loop came to me in a dream and I love it. And the B and the O and the V also wanted to relate to each other. They were too loud at the top. They looked awkward when there were three of them disconnecting in a row. Um, Tweety, yeah, that doesn't work. And then closed loops to the rescue. The T went through a phase where it thought that it could be disconnected, which did actually, I thought, looked really good next to itself. Um, I showed that to some coworkers one day and they thought it was a ligature, which was like mission accomplished. Uh, when you make something that looks like a ligature, but it's not. And then it went 100, almost 100% 100 connecting again, humbly returned. And looking back at all of these versions, which I'm really glad that I kept, I can see how I would try something and realize it wouldn't work, and then leave it for a bit, long enough to forget why that thing didn't work, and then try it again. Or else I would um, start one way and then think that I could do better, and then it turns out, no, the first way was closest. Like, you can see the Z and the F, at the uh, most recent one at the bottom, are most resemble the F and the Z at the top. And I suppose the answer to this might be to take more copious notes of my own work so that I can keep track. So now that I've explored what it, some of the challenges that it takes to um, that uh, making casual script lettering poses, making a font out of casual script lettering poses, um, I suppose the next thing might be to try to break down a mechanical, uh, more formal script and see how that works. I think that'll definitely be easier, but I always think that. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>